Hello class, uh, this is the third video in the segment on absolutism in which I discuss how did Louis XIV become the most powerful monarch of his time. Uh, Louis XIV takes power into six, in 1661. Uh, he is in his 20s, so he's relatively young, um, and he's going to rule all the way uh, until 1715. So uh, you have a, uh, you know essentially a 50-year reign of Louis XIV, and so he takes some steps to make France uh, uh, strong economically, uh, politically, and to make them the cultural center of Europe. Um, so, what does uh, what does Louis the sixth, uh, Louis the fourteenth do uh, to strengthen or to put himself on the path of being an absolute monarch? Uh, number one, he kicks all uh, French nobles off of any government councils that they were on. Um, in effect, he uh, removes them from being able to make or to have any impact on French uh, policies or decisions that the government makes. Um, he gives that power to himself. So he, in, a, in effect, has complete or absolute uh, control over the, uh, the French government. He also uh, grants uh, some power, some, uh, some additional responsibilities uh, to middle-class government officials that are located outside of Paris. And these government officials are the ones that uh, will collect taxes and administer justice. Um, and therefore, uh, he will be consistently and constantly be in contact with them, uh, making sure that they are enforcing uh, his policies and promoting his values. Uh, to make France stronger economically, um, he puts in uh, he puts uh, a man named Jean Baptiste Colbert um, as finance minister of France, and Colbert will take some steps to strengthen the French economy. Uh, Colbert believes in something called mercantilism or mercantilism, and this is a belief that a country should be self-sufficient. Um, they should um, have a favorable balance of trade in which they. Uh, export or they sell more goods than they import, um, you know, not relying on goods made outside of their country. Um, to do this, Colbert uh, expands French manufacturing. Um, he will give French companies more government money. He will give them uh, tax credits in which they can, uh, you know, use this uh, additional money or revenue to produce more, to hire more, and to make them uh, stronger, um, you know, more competitive um, against these outside, uh, you know, outside competitors. Um, he will also uh, protect French companies um, from outside competition by putting into place uh, tariffs. These are taxes on imported goods or goods made outside of France um, and thereby making foreign goods more expensive and less appealing uh, to the French citizens, um, hopefully encouraging them to buy goods made inside of France um, and therefore keeping money in France. Um, he will also encourage people to, uh, to settle in French colonies, uh, namely in Canada, um, and encouraging the French fur trade, once again bringing uh, you know, a favorable balance of trade to France in which they will export or sell more goods than they buy from other countries, um, and then making France a stronger economic power um, you know, internationally. Um, so what does Louis XIV do um, to promote the arts? Uh, Louis XIV uh, is known as the Sun King. Uh, he believes in, a, in living a very luxurious and grand style. Um, and he surrounds himself with items of luxury. Um, you know, and he does promote, he's a huge patron of the arts. Um, and a great example of uh, Louis XIV, uh, you know, his power, or the great example of Louis the Fourteenth, um, you know, um, being Louis the Fourteenth being an absolute monarch, um, is his palace at Versailles. Uh, Versailles is located about eleven miles south of Paris, and Louis the Fourteenth decides to build this tremendous castle palace there. Um, this castle is about five hundred yards, as far as that's how big it is. Um, you know, that's how big this estate is. Uh, so imagine five football fields uh, stacked up one after the other, and this is Louis XIV's palace.
Um, you know, you have 500, um, you know, servants, cooks, waiters, um, you know, willing to serve or waiting to serve Louis the Fourteenth here. Um, and also, uh, Louis the Fourteenth uses his palace at Versailles uh, to weaken uh, the power and the influence of the French nobility. He orders the French nobles to stay with him at Versailles, um, thereby... Um, you know, limiting their influence um, that they have in their hometowns. If they're not in their hometowns outside of Versailles, uh, they can't spread ideas or they can't gain support um, in any sort of attempts to challenge the French, uh, the French king. Um, Louis the Fourteenth also by keeping them at Versailles, he makes the nobles, uh, you know, compete for his uh, for his attention. Um, and, you know, every morning when Louis wakes up, he will have a hundred nobles waiting to help dress him and serve him, um, you know, so thereby, you know, um, making them dependent on him. Uh, Louis the Fourteenth will encourage and support the arts. Uh, he doesn't do this in the medieval sense, uh, which the arts are used to glorify God. He doesn't do this in the Renaissance sense or the humanist sense, which uh, the arts are a way to glorify the human potential. Uh, he uses the arts to uh, glorify the king and to promote values that are important to him. Uh, Louis XIV also wants to make France a strong uh, you know, military power. He wants to expand the French Empire, and he is successful at first in doing this. However, by the 1680s, uh, you know, he fails in his attempt to expand um, you know, the French Empire. Um, why or how does he do this? Um, when he is successful in expanding the French, uh, French territory um, in the 1660s and 1670s, um, you start to see countries in Central Europe band together and form what is known as the League of Augsburg. And these smaller, weaker country news, countries are forming an alliance with each other uh, to balance or to equal the power of France. And so uh, when Louis XIV gets involved in these wars in the 1680s and onwards, um, um, you know, he uh, or France has to, um, you know, go against multiple countries in which uh, they prove to be unsuccessful in achieving their military objectives. Um, some of these wars are, you know, the War of Spanish Succession or the Seven Years Wars uh, in which uh, France is going to be unsuccessful in, in, um, um, in, in expanding their territory. Um, when Louis XIV dies in 1715, he leaves a legacy both, uh, you know, um, that look, that he leaves a legacy in which history will look both positively on and negatively. Uh, some positive aspects of Louis XIV's reign um, as, uh, as King of France or absolute monarch of France is that he, uh, France does emerge, um, you know, as the leader in Europe, uh, both politically and culturally. Um, you know, people look to France for, um, for influence in the arts, um, and they are the, the strongest political country um, in international or European affairs. Um, negatively, Louis XIV leaves a uh, legacy of debt. Um, with his uh, wars, with the building of the Palace of Versailles, with his luxurious lifestyle, he will more than triple uh, the debt that France has to deal with. Um, and post-1715, um, this burden uh, or this burden of the debt will be placed upon the shoulders of the French people in the forms of taxes. And this debt will um, you know, continue to be a problem and will be eventually will be one of the causes of the French Revolution um, towards the end of the 1700s. Uh, please look at uh, look for some of my other videos um, in which I will discuss uh, Central Europe and Russia and England.